Arkadaşlar herkese merhaba. Ee, bu branşlar konusunda çektiğim ikinci video oluyor. Ee, i̇lk videomuzu Ekin arkadaşımızla histopatoloji üzerine çekmiştik. Ee, bugün de e, genel olarak e, bize e, İngiltere'de tıp fakültesi ve sonrası deneyimini e, paylaşmak üzere harika bir konuğum var. E, Doktor Yakup Kılıç. E, Yakup İngiltere'de doğmuş büyümüş bir Türk genci <gülüyor> ama... E, Bizler e, Türkiye'den İngiltere'ye göçtükten sonra e, adeta bizden biri gibi e, bütün e, sorularımızda, e, sıkıntılarımızda hep yanımızda oldu. E, grubumuzun e, çok önemli bir parçası. E, buradan onun için de çok teşekkür ediyorum Yakup'cum sana. E, kendisi e, İngiltere doğup büyüdüğü için hani ifade anlamında kendisini... E, İngilizce konuşarak daha e, rahat ve özgür hissediyor. O yüzden bu konuşmamızın devamı İngilizce olacak. E, hoş geldin Yakup. Hoş bulduk hocam. Thank you for having me. Now we can continue in English. Uh, thank you so much for being here today. Uh, I'm sure I'm sure your experiences will um, be very helpful for so many people as you're a very valuable com uh, valuable person in our medical thank community you. here. Thank you. Um, really, really much. Firstly, uh, let's start with your background. Could you please yeah. introduce yourself to us? Sure. Sure, perfect. Thank you so much. And thank you, Asante. So my name is Jakob. Um, I'm uh, from Turkey, obviously, Eastern Turkey. My parents are from Arda. Um, they settled here in the 90s and I was, I was born and raised and educated here. Uh, I'm currently uh, an ST2 radiology registrar uh, at UCLH Hospital. Uh, prior to that, I did uh, internal medicine training uh, at in the Northwest London Deanery at Imperial. Um, and I think I made the best decision <laughs> of leaving medicine and going into uh, radiology, which we'll get into all, into all about. Uh, and I want to use this opportunity to try and help all the international med medical graduates give some tips and tricks to uh, help them on their journey to the UK. That's great. Thank you so much. Um, so uh, you went to medical school in London as well? No, so I went to Edinburgh and also in Prague. Oh, okay. I did not know that. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> That's yeah, yeah. great. So you went to medical school in Scotland and Czech Republic and then yeah. uh, came to Imperial College to do your IMT training. Exactly. And exactly. then you finished, you became MRCP. And then exactly. that led you into a way into radiology. So you are exactly. now a second year trainee. It's exactly. called ST2 for those of you that don't know. Um, exactly. He's in one of the best, I think, teaching hospitals in London. It's called University College Hospitals London, yeah. right? London Hospital. Yeah, correct. Right? Yeah. yeah. So um, let's start from your medical school after your uh, graduation. Yeah. Yeah. And can you please tell us a little bit about the foundation years, what they yeah. are, yeah. Uh, what are okay. being done? So in the UK, when you finish medical school, even actually it applies to non-UK graduates now as well. Before 2019, there was this issue where Anyway, anyone graduating from abroad, there was this, there was this problem where if you're a non-UK graduate, you can't apply to training program. But that's now all gone. Everyone's equal, which I think is excellent and gives a big opportunity for from everyone outside to apply. So once you have your GMC right, the license, you pass your PLABS and everything. Um, you start off. The first step in the UK is called foundation program. It's a two-year internship program. I think in Turkey, it's counted as your sixth year. It counts yes. as an FY one year. I think. So in, in the UK, that's two years. So FY1 and then FY2, also called an SA senior house officer year. After those two years, so in those two years, you have four months rotations throughout the two years in several different specialities. And the main aim of that is trying to sort of have a taste of different uh, departments and different specialities, see what you would be interested in. And then at the end of F2 or early F2, sorry, you then apply for further training. Um, nowadays, what's common is people go out of training to do FY3 year, locum year. Mm. We'll uh, talk about that a bit later. But training wise, after FY2, you do core medical training or core surgical training. Or, for example, in psychiatry, you do core psychiatry training. Um, or you can directly go to what's run through, which we'll talk about as well, like in histopathology and in radiology. Um, talking about, we'll come back to that, but in terms of core medical and surgery, which most people choose, After that, you apply for ST3 or 4 higher training. And at each of these points, there's an interview application stage. 
for each point. And that, so two years of FYF, two, two to three years of core training, and then four to five years of higher specialty training, and then you're a consultant. Most people do a fellowship after that, uh, mm -hmm. but that's person dependent and where they want to work and things like that. Yeah, so it, it takes a little bit longer uh, compared to Turkey. Um, so you do your internships as FY1 and FY2, which is the great that doctors who are newly graduates from Turkey can uh, go into the system from, exactly. right? Exactly. After getting their GMC registration yeah. through yeah. labs, yeah. they yeah. can apply yeah. for FY2, also called SHO, Senior exactly. House Officer Jobs. Yeah, and then um, for um, getting into the training, could you please a little bit, you know, uh, explain it more? Uh, do you need sure. an exam for every one of them? Sure. Or So, uh, so uh, FY1, FY2, you don't really need an exam. But for standalone FY2, I think they're introducing, so they've, they've got interviews. Uh, I think they're introducing SJT exams. So I'm not 100% sure on that. Mm -hmm. But I'm, what I know mostly about is after you've got your uh, FY1, FY2 done, uh, international medical graduates can apply for core medical training or higher specialty training. One thing to mention, though, uh, those of those IMGs who want to, who are thinking to apply for the foundation program, in fact, what you can also do is, as many people know, do a year of SHO or a non-training job and get the crest form and then mm -hmm. apply for higher training, core training, which is in some ways you save a year rather than in two years, you do one year, you get the same thing in essence uh, mm -hmm. and then apply for core training. Now for core medical training and core surgical training, which is the majority of applicants, um, you uh, do an interview. So for medical training, I know you do just your portfolio and you do an application on what's called Oriel, which is a, a website where we apply for doctors and medical professionals apply for training um, on that website you fill in the form and then you upload, upload your crest form and then for medical training you get an interview and based on your interview performance you get an offer surgical training now what I've heard is a part of it is um, you have to do the MSRA exam which is like an mm -hmm. entrance exam uh, which can, we can talk about as well in a bit um, and uh, that depending on what score you get, then you get, if you've got to get up, up above a certain cutoff, then you get called for interview. And then based on your score and your interview score and an all, amalgamation of everything, then you get an offer. I think in OBS and Gynia, similarly, in, in core psychiatry and GP training though, uh, you, it's just the MSRA as far as okay. uh, I understand. And uh, okay. you, you check the website because there's a few specialties where MSRA is just used for uh, the application uh, scoring or just for interview. Okay, just to repeat it, uh, the website that you can uh, apply to training is called Oriel. Yes. Um, and could you please say what a crest form is for those that don't know? Yeah, so it's a certificate of readiness to enter specialty training, I think is what it stands for. It's the exact or very similar form to the FY2 competency form. So what's expected from a FY2 doctor. So things like, you know, cannulas, uh, does this person speak good English? You know, can they take history from a patient? And um, things like DNAR even, or, you know, some some of it, you, and in fact, you don't see in other countries like DNAR. I think in Turkey, there's not such a concept maybe, or it's, it's a very new concept in Turkey, but we yeah. even have that here. So if, if you can do DNAR discussions and so on, um, and that's all part of your competencies or F, what's expected for an FY2 doctor. So that when you're an ST1 or a core trainee, you're at a certain level and everyone's the same level. Yeah, so uh, for uh, those of you that graduated from Turkey and then worked for a while as a general practitioner somewhere, you can get your crest form signed from Turkey and get into training straight away if you are um, um, past your PLABS, if you pass your PLABS, and also um, do you need certain things for crest forms, like you said? I mean, do, is there a specific time period that you should be working in? Uh, I think I think it's a I think it's a minimum of three months. So the consultant okay. signing the form should should you should be working with that consultant for at least three months, and it, and it's valid for three and a half years. I, I see, I see. It might change, okay, but please the check. Form. Yeah, they, these things always change. Exactly, it changes um, from year on year. Yeah, so you could either go into GP training or psychiatry training. All those yeah. pathways have their own uh, thing. So it's and it's, it keeps changing. So please make sure. Whatever you want to go for, please make sure you check all the requirements before you do. Yeah. Um, so for you, uh, it was IMT training, right? So yeah. um, it's very different from Turkey because when we say IMT, it is internal medicine with yeah. 
uh, certain subspecialties afterwards, which are like rheumatology, hematology, mm. Mm. Uh, oncology, um, like that. And uh, you are working for four years. And then if you want to get into those spe subspecialties, you need to take another exam. And then two or three more years, you have to do the subspecialty. Uh, but you can be a general IMT as well, which is not anything, which is not, I don't think it's, uh, you can be a general. I mean, after finishing IMT, what do you need to do? Okay, so these are the main differences that yeah. people from Turkey should understand. Yeah, perfect. So let's say you've done, uh, let's say you got into IMT. Now, IMT is either two years or three years. And I'll explain why. So um, speaking, talking about the three year version of IMT, the first two years you're called ST1 and ST2. And it's usually four to six months rotations. Mm -hmm. And essentially you're at an SHO level. Uh, so a bit senior than an F2, but still at an SHO level. And you rotate in different medical specialties. So as you said, rheumatology for six months, maybe cardiology, maybe respiratory medicine and so on. You also do a compulsory geriatrics block and a compulsory ITU block. And that's really mm -hmm. good because you get um, ex exposed to like different, like doing central venous access and, you know. The ITU stands for? Intensive care, sorry. Intensive okay. care. Okay, that's okay. Intensive care. <laughs> Um, and then after those two years, third year is what you're, then you become a medical registrar. I, I know it's it. Med say reg, as you're always talking med about. Reg. Yeah, it's called med uh, reg year and it's the exactly. deal. <laughs> yeah. I, I've done, I did that for six months and uh, I can say it's the most stressful time of my life. Uh, you know, my, hat, my hat's off to people who do that job. It is very stressful and demanding. So you do that for a year uh, in your IMT three year, but in the IMT one year, you have to pass the MRCP part one. And then in um, by IMT3, you have to pass PACES. So uh, okay. part two and PACES. Um, in extenuating circumstances, you can extend it. So after you have your PACES and you've done IMT1, 2, 3, you can apply for core specialities like respiratory medicine, cardiology, gastroenterology. But for other specialities, such as dermatology, I think genetics, uh, there's a whole list of other specialties, uh, allergy medicine, for example. You only do two years of IMT. You don't have to do three years of IMT. So that's oh, the I difference. See. So okay. if you go on the uh, Royal College website, it differentiates group one and group two specialities. How many years you have to do for group one? How many years you have to do for group two? I think group two was cardiology, respiratory, all the core ones. And the other ones, which are shorter, are for two years. Do you still need to do PACES uh, if you you're in a two-year? Okay. Yeah, you still need to do PACES. Okay um also um what what are your responsibilities during those three years like what yeah. do you do in um the hospital yeah so during imt one and two um you start off by so you're very much under throughout the imt one two three you're your supervisor you have a supervisor named educations and clinical supervisor you're always on work under the uh, supervision uh, but out of hours, for example, you and during IMT one and two, you've got a registrar or the medical registrar. So you, if if you're if you're if you're stuck, you ask for help from them. Um, and typical things you do, for example, during IMT one and two, you, you can do clinics, for example. There are compulsory clinics you have to you have to hit a quota uh, with the help of a consultant, and then you lead ward rounds even just to prepare mm -hmm. you for IMT3 and beyond and consultant life in the future. But from IMT3, I would say there's a big jump between IMT2 and IMT3, which a lot of people don't really appreciate. But I, I, I felt a big jump between IMT2 and 3 because overnight in August, that changeover period, you're med reg, and then you're the most senior person at night there. Mm -hmm. So you're leading cardiac arrests, uh, you know, acutely unwell patients on the ward. And there's, remember, in some hospitals, there's only one med reg. Sometimes you look after the wards, which can be 500 patients and everyone coming in A&E. And then you've got maybe two, three SHOs. Mm -hmm. So everything so depends on you. Everything depends on you. Exactly. So uh, that's why I say, you know, I really look up to them. It's kind of like your first day uh, as a graduate from Turkey, you know. <laughs> um, <laughs> you, uh, you have your graduation uh, after your internship one day and then you get into the lottery, we call it, and then you start yeah. somewhere with all those responsibilities so they exactly. would understand. So to my understanding, um, before starting IMT, you kind of need to uh, decide what you want to do in the future. Was that yeah. the same thing for you? Like, did you know you were going to do radiology? So to be honest, from F2, so I did my F2 in Royal London and St. Mm -hmm. Bartholomew Hospital. And during that, I had exposure to cardiologists. Uh, my plan was cardiology initially, okay? okay. But my research I did was based on imaging. And that side of the things really grabbed my attention. Um, so 
I continued that path. And then what made me switch from cardiology to radiology, apart from the imaging side, um, I looked at it in a bit of a practical way. So IMT, so IMT is three years, five years of cardiology, and cardiology you need three years of PhD as well. Oh, okay. So that's eleven years. So and then maybe one or two years of um, fellowship. So to, I I know cardiologists who are like fifteen years in training. So I really didn't want to be in that position. I said to myself, you know, I love imaging, I love the hands-on stuff like ultrasound and so on. Uh, and I thought radiology was a perfect mix. And it's radiology is only five years. It, for intervention is one more year and that's it and you're a consultant. Mm -hmm. That's great. What kind of uh, fellowships? Um, so a fellowship is kind of sub-specializing in that specialty that you finished as, and became so, a consultant in, right? So, so so fellowship, essentially, let's say you finish IMT and you do cardiology for, for four or five years, so how, mm -hmm. how long it is now. Um, during the first two years, it's like core cardiology, and then ST four five is like subspecialty. So you do your subspecialty during training, okay. but some people they look they do further fellowship for a more niche area, mm -hmm. or just to consolidate what they've learned in training. And just just before a consultant job, they like to do a fellowship job just to be build up their confidence and learn a bit more. Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes some people just do it because they can't find a job in cardiology. It's quite difficult currently, actually um consultant job especially in london um i see um so for radiology uh normally because you shifted later on uh you said do you need to do three years of imt before applying for radiology no, or radiology okay. straight from f2 you can apply okay. so e even even if you have a crest form let's say mm -hmm. you're in turkey and you have a crest form uh, you can apply straight away. Okay, so let's talk about those a bit. For example, I know because I'm a pathologist that you can apply for histopathology right after FY2 um, exactly. with portfolio. You don't even need an exam. Uh, with your CV and portfolio, you can apply for it. Uh, it's Is it called run through? Because it's five years. Um, and you don't need to do any IMT training beforehand or, um, yeah. Most F2 or Crest, if you have Crest or you finish F2, you can apply. Um, you just sit the MSRA exam. You need a portfolio. Don't get me wrong. You need to have to go have a good CV as well. Yeah. Radiology, there was around between four to 6,000 applicants mm -hmm. last year uh, for 300 places. Okay. And in London, 50. Okay, I see. I see. So yeah, if you uh, want to decide what you want to do uh, beforehand, even before you graduate, maybe graduate, yeah. uh, that would be better to build your portfolio, exactly. right? Exactly. Yeah. So radiology, how many years you said? Five, five years. years. And pathology is the same. So they're all run through uh, five years, you are SD1235, and then you're a consultant, but you need to do your FRCRs. Correct. So FRCR part one in first year, FRCR part 2A in ST3 and 2B in ST4. So what kind of exams are they? Um... So part one is physics and anatomy, just uh, just MCQ based exam. Multiple, multiple choice exam. questions. Multiple. So we call it a test. Yeah. So That's test, uh, a test. Yeah. And then part two is again written, uh, but more clinical, if that makes sense, more uh, imaging, but more clinical, essentially. Again, no pictures, just MCQ, mm -hmm. test, test. And then uh, 2B is a viva, oral viva. So the consultant can show you a case of, I don't know, lung fibrosis and, you know, or, or do they give you a CT scan or MRI and they say, well, take me through the scan, give me your report like this how long does it take because our part two takes two days <laughs> I don't think it's, uh, so, oh two, so two a takes one but there's two a's two papers and it's three hours long hmm. two b i think is three or four hours long maybe up to six hours long i see so we could say you have three exams to pass yeah uh, yeah. yeah because they're done separately okay uh, how many attempts do you get do you know um because for um, example for frc part, part two you need you have only four attempts in your whole life if you fail them you can't get that degree so so my understanding we have five attempts and then mm -hmm. with special permission from the college up to six attempts yeah if yeah if you had a big excuse like a health related yeah. issue or something uh, you can get another attempt like with your help from your uh, supervisors okay exactly. Um, so as a radiology trainee, um, can you tell us more about like your daily routine um, yeah. throughout the years? Yeah. yeah. How many so, on calls you have? 
because that's a big yeah. issue for Turkish people. <laughs> really? Okay. So I'm, uh, I'll tell you how, how it is now for me because I'm ST2, I'm a bit senior. So ST2, uh, working day starts at nine. Beautiful. <laughs> Before it was really bad. Nine, I work walking, go to Costa, take my coffee first. Great. <laughs> and then go up to my office. The beautiful thing I love about radio is you have your own office, you have your own computer. On the wards, it was mayhem, you know. Sometimes you would be sitting on the dustbin you won't have a chance. It's just crazy on the woods. <laughs> anyway, anyway, so I go into work, um, you know, have my coffee. Uh, and then in the morning, I go through some plain films. So x-rays, so, you know, chest x-rays, x-rays of the limbs, do a bit of reporting of that. And then I, after between um, 11 and uh, 1 o'clock, I hold a hot form, which is basically betting. So A&E calls me or doctors on the wards call me and I bet. Uh, scans approved scans uh, i don't this concept i don't know if you have it in turkey so um, i don't think so i haven't finance, worked in radiology but yeah uh, so, so betting part, is kind of like being a secretary or in a, in a way so in like a way. Uh, so okay. ionizing radiation regulations in the uk state that every test or ct scan ionizing radiation has to be vetted justified uh, yeah. so any doctor can't request anything they have to call me only mm -hmm. if let's say it makes sense so for example you know 30 year old they're long to growing pain hematuria we want to see tkb for renal stones for example something like that i bet i say okay it can happen and then but I say, you have to me. you have to do it for them to be able to send the patient to you after they have to oh. say i have to say yes then. okay so, okay and then after i say yes they speak to the radiographer and then the radiographer does the ct scan so betting but during that time we also report hot scans from a e so as i'm getting calls i'm doing reporting as well from from a &E, so it's busy so you can imagine as i'm trying to report there's 50 calls coming in and you can lose concentration and actually miss stuff it is it can be very stressful so that's from 11 to 1 and from 1 to 2 i have my break my lunch time which is amazing i never had that before <laughs> um, which is really good really does have have a massive difference um, and then between one and two, we have protected teaching with consultant one to one. Uh, and then after that time, um, certain days I do CT and MR reporting for the rest of the day. I do intervention, drains, um, you know, vascular studies, and so on. Well, within you seem to be very in it. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I from love, second I year. That. Yeah, that's great. But yeah. are you being supervised uh, doing yeah, all yeah. that so, stuff? Yeah. So from ST one, every scan you do your x-ray whatever you do is is signed off by a consultant mm -hmm. st2 all the x-rays you, you can independently sign off all the x-rays and ultrasounds you can independently sign off but every ct and mri you you draft or you write the report but the consultant checks and the consultant signs off um do you work beside a consultant for a while like observe them and do they teach you on site or do you just learn on oh. the meetings in, in ST1, it, how it works is you, at the beginning, that does happen. But when you get more senior, you just go away and you report. And then maybe, say you did five CTs, you find a consultant and you go for it with the consultants. Okay. And then they sign off. Okay. And then during the day, you also attend MDT meetings. So uh, multidisciplinary team meetings mm -hmm. to discuss cases from with different specialities. And that's a very important skill to learn. And you also have protected, uh, as you get more senior, you also have protected subspecialty time um, when you're not on call. Now, in terms of on calls, mm -hmm. um, we at UCH, we don't do night shifts, which is amazing. It's teleradiology. Um, Great. We do, yeah. So we do um, uh, on call from 10 o'clock to 7 p.m. Um, and then... Uh, after 7 p.m. it's it's uh, teleradiology but during that time we do authorize and the consultant checks the next day okay uh, great that you can see your specialty through a screen right <laughs> so you don't have to be there <laughs> yeah so uh, they um, do the uh, radiographic imaging and then send it to you and then you authorize you're mm -hmm. kind of all on, on on call but not on site right so you don't have to stay in the hospital um, when, when you're on call you do have to stay in hospital oh okay so yeah. Oh, okay. So for your hospital, it's not like that. I see. Yeah, I yeah, see. Yeah. But um, um, can we, um, I think we skip that part quickly because it's a big issue in Turkey. Um, mm -hmm. I know there's a rule uh, because I am not doing on calls. I am not really uh, certain about this, but mm -hmm. there's a strict time, um, times of on calls that you can do as a doctor. Yeah. 
uh, can yeah. you tell us a bit about that? Like in general, yeah. during yeah. IMT or, you know. Yeah. So so so technically, um, the BMA dictates you can't. So our on calls are essentially twelve hours maximum, mm -hmm. and you can do up to four back to back on calls, and you have to have two to three days off after that. We don't do twenty four hours on call. We do do non resident on call twenty four hours, which is basically, um, you you can be home, you're on call but you're at home. You can, uh, if anything happens, then you come into hospital. I see. But then you get a day off afterwards. Yeah. Also, you get paid for it, right? Of course, of course, you get paid for it. You get so I about... think current situation in Turkey right now, uh, we just uh, got the thing as night off, sorry, day off after the night call. Um, yeah. But now I think because they are taking the day off, they're not getting paid for it. Something like yeah, that. that. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, we get paid for it. Yeah. And there is a certain amount of time that you can be on call. It's not like limitless. It's not mm -hmm. like um, I'm talking about like in the UK, because um, let's say you are you have a shortage of trainees in some departments, then all the ones that are left behind have to do all the sh night shifts in Turkey, which is kind of like a slavery, I think. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. But over here, uh, you are kind of protected. Uh, there is, um, they say that there is a certain amount of time a person can work healthily. Um, and that it's way, a doctor can help uh, the patients. Yeah, so, mm -hmm. okay, great. Um, I would like to talk a bit, a bit about the exam process. I, mm -hmm. I think you are an examiner. Are you? Still? Yeah. yeah. yeah uh, so so uh, I recently, I haven't done it for some time now. I have left it. Uh, but I, yeah, I was recently an examiner, PLAB examiner. Uh, PLAB 2? I think, yeah, okay. I haven't yeah, done the PLAB. So PLAB 2, yeah, you, uh, yeah. okay. Uh, do you have any recommendations for uh, the people who are preparing for it? Um, yeah. My, so my biggest re recommendation would be to, really really practice find friends to practice each scenario with um, um i i think one of the big what i've realized in candidates who don't do really well is they, they come unprepared or uh, and the biggest part is communication in the uk in medical school in the medical school curriculum communication is such a key element how to com communicate with the patients or colleagues but uh from outside that's I, I think that's not the case as much and the part where uh, most times you don't do so well is in communication mm -hmm. so I think it's, it's very very important to try and uh, practice with a colleague each scenarios uh, uh, and go through them step by step and even record each other you know to see how they're doing that's that's the that's the main thing I would say um, I think there's a few courses, uh, online courses and face-to-face -face courses, which are which are helpful. I don't know any sp specifically, but the thing is, you can see if someone's really well rehearsed, and you can see when someone's natural. Uh, people who are you know, sort of natural, who just flow off, do really well. I I, I would say, um, but unfortunately, I can't talk too much about the exams. <laughs> Yeah, of course, uh, I know. It's just uh, a general idea. So I heard yeah. that some people memorize what they're going to say. And mm -hmm. as examiners, you can tell that somebody just exactly. rehearsed it. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> I see. I see. Okay. And about the MSRA exam, um, yeah. uh, can you um, recommend some study strategies or which books to prepare from? Of course, of course. So MSRA is split into two parts, clinical problem solving and SJT. The clinical solving problem problem solving part is very basic. It's essentially things like, for example, a nine, a twenty year old came in uh, with uh, she with some bleeding, what's the and tummy pain? What do you do? D dimer troponin B T H C G. These type of questions, and they're very easy questions that you can revise. Uh, if you go on past medicine, which is the question back I recommend first to start from past medicine, uh, and then if you have some past test and M C Q bank. For the SJT part, the key thing about SJT, which is it's called situation judgment test, it's, mm -hmm. it's essentially a test to see how, as a doctor, you would react in different certain in certain scenarios, in ethical scenarios mainly, uh, in a in a hospital. The, they based all the questions off the Good Medical Practice GMC on the GMC website, the Good Medical Practice book. So if you read that inside out, that's essentially your Bible for it. And then following that, you can also do past medicine, SJT, and there's a um, Omar Taha Blue Book. And if you have time, MCQ Bank and past test. Another big resource that I used that really helped me was the foundation FY2 past papers. 
Foundation Program SGAT past papers. If you just Google that, that comes up. That's really helpful, especially the explanations answering uh, the SJT part. I think compared to the clinical problem solving part, the SJT part is the hardest part. And I really think you can, if you rise for it, you can really, you can really do well. Okay, great. Um, could you also tell us a little bit about, because I know, and we are doing some projects together, uh, you are also interested in research. Um, yeah. So for Turkish people, uh, research is something that you don't normally do uh, if you don't want to, uh, when you're a consultant or when you're a trainee. I mean, in training, yes, your uh, consultants will tell you to do some, you know, posters or like presentations in congresses. But after you're a consultant, if you don't want it, um, if you don't want like an academical degree, uh, you don't go for it. Uh, how is the case here? Uh, can you uh, be a researcher, um, earn money, and then work as a clinician at the same time? Yeah. So here, um, it's similar in some ways, different in some ways. Here, um, you don't have to, as a consultant, depending where you work, for example, in a small DGH hospital, you can be a normal consultant without doing any research at all. It's entirely up to you. But in other hospitals, big hospitals, tertiary centre hospitals, um, having papers and publications is very important. Aside mm -hmm. from that, what I would say is as, as a trainee, I think it's important to publish, especially applying for the, when you apply for consultant jobs, because they really do look at that, if you yeah. ha how published you are. Because not only that, it shows your team working skills and communication skills and so on. So I think publication is very is key. In terms of um, being a clinician and a, and a, and a um academic that is possible uh, in training we call that the acf program academic clinical fellow problem program which you can apply alongside training training that helps you um apply for a phd later on and then a clinical lectureship role as a just before you become a consultant and then when you become a consultant it allows you to separate your time like maybe 40 percent clinical 60 percent uh, academic hmm. the only thing is even if you go down the route of academia uh, you don't get an extra pay rise as much compared to being full full clinical it, yeah. it's just it's just if, if you wanted to if you have a passion you can do it but it doesn't give you a massive advantage financially as well. yeah for uh, histopathology uh, i have been having discussions with people too and most of them say it's not worth it I mean, it's yeah. not worth the time that you're spending on it. Yeah. But if you're you have a passion for it, like you and I, let's say, um, exactly. uh, it's doable. Like uh, you can take a part time clinical job and do a research job um, side as a side um, job. Exactly. I exactly. think. Okay, so that's uh, something that is kind of different from Turkey. Uh, the job that you do uh, actually matters. Um, you can go into a certain research. Um, you can get research grants. Uh, you can go work for like an organization doing research about it for some time exactly. uh, for exactly. their projects. So um, that's a big bonus for me, at least. Um, okay, so I think we kind of quickly and comprehensively talked about uh, kind of everything that I wanted to ask for. Yeah. Um, my last question will be about your social life. Uh, I know you have a kid, uh, yeah. you're married uh, and you live in London. So yeah. uh, with all those uh, strikes and all those, you know, salary yeah. discussions going on, are yeah. you happy overall? Um, I think s since getting into radio, I am happy. Mm -hmm. um, my, I have more of a work-life balance. The only thing I would say is during, when you step into training compared to non-training, you get, you get a bit of a salary drop, but you can locum, you can locum in A&E uh, or the other locums to meet, to meet that uh, threshold for, to make up for the amount you've lost. Uh, but I, I would say I am happy, despite everything going on, despite um, you know all the strikes and problems as you know in the NHS, I still love my job. I still love what I do. I still love helping people. Uh, and I think that's a, the, you need to love what you do, I would say. Yeah, that's true. Uh, and I think we always dwell on what's happening now. We don't really think about what's going to happen in the future in terms of when you're a consultant, things will be very different. And I have these conversations a lot uh, with senior colleagues. You know, they say, yeah, look, you're, you're struggling. You know, everyone struggles now. And that's the point. At the beginning, you struggle a bit. And then later on, it becomes more. And I really do think uh, as a consultant, life will be much, much, much better compared to to to a trainee, and then you, you'll be more independent as well. 
Um, so there's light at the end of the tunnel, essentially. Yes, and that's, that's what work. they say to me too. Just focus on being a consultant at once, but don't rush it at the same time because it's not easy passing yeah. the exams. Um, exactly. But yeah, uh, one last question. I am thinking of doing another radiology-based um, interview with like a consultant later on that came from Turkey. But um, radiologists who uh, come through the PLAB route um yeah. can they get any jobs here without giving okay, any frcr exams okay so the thing is if you give frcr exams which i i would recommend all the radiologists to do you don't need to do club you can just you can just mm -hmm. uh you get automatic registration if you do frcr if you don't have frcr you can apply to to become associate specialist or trust grade doctors now some hospitals it depends on hospitals some hospitals do expect uh, do accept these doctors and you work uh, with consultants. You are technically a consultant, uh, but you're named an associate specialist. Um, and they, they help you get the FRCI exams. Uh, and even, even if you want extra training on whatever subspecialty you, you want. So it is possible, but it depends on which hospital where you apply. So some places don't accept, some places do. Okay, yeah, I see. Uh, it's the same uh, in pathology as well. I mean, if you want to move on with your career, you need to do your FRC path exam. So it's better to just appear for them uh, when you are trying to uh, get into the system so that you can get into it from a higher grade. Exactly. Yeah, and we have uh, radiologists from Turkey who are in higher grades who did these uh, exams and came here. Um, Okay, um, that's kind of, uh, I don't want to take it too long because then I know the people who listen to it uh, get a little bit distracted, but uh, please feel free to uh, put all your comments in the in the below, of, uh, you know, uh, of the video that I'll post and Jakob is always here, he's always helping us. Um, if it's something that I don't know, I can always ask him and I'll let you know, uh, you can write to me from my Instagram as well. And yeah. Jakob, thank you so much for like, no problem, um, no uh, I'm talking in behalf of all of us. Uh, you thank have you. been always uh, here for us and you thank have you. such a kind heart and you're so, thank so you. um, enthusiastic about what you do. So that um, that is very valuable to us. And uh, I can't wait to do like more projects with you. <laughs> yeah, me yeah. too. You're really looking forward to it. If, also, if, feel free to, if anyone wants to message me, feel free to message me on uh, on Twitter or whatever. He's on Twitter <laughs> and he's active. Yeah. So <laughs> you can reach yeah, him. <laughs> Happy yes. to help. Yeah, thank you so much. Perfect. Thank you.